Cool. Right? Okay. All right. Got the word. Welcome, everyone, today. We are so excited to have Kristen Rodriguez and Katie Novak with us. Today, they are the authors of Universally Designed Leadership, which is a terrific uh, book about how to implement uh, UDL in districts and uh, schools. Um, Kristen Rodriguez is founder and CEO of the Rodriguez Educational Consulting Agency. She uh, uh, has been a superintendent of schools, uh, held a number of other district uh, positions, including curriculum director and uh, curriculum and instruction director, uh, assistant superintendent. Um, she um, has a doctorate from Boston College and is just a wonderful educator and routinely uh, in her uh, district practice uh, received exemplary ratings uh, from the state of Massachusetts. Katie Novak, uh, known to many of you, but uh, is also a, a terrific school administrator, currently assistant superintendent at Groton Dunstable Regional uh, Schools in Massachusetts. Katie, you may know, is the uh, author of uh, a number of books, including the best-selling UDL Now, uh, also UDL, co-author of UDL in the Cloud, about uh, online um, course design with the UDL principles. And we're very excited to announce that uh, Katie has um, a terrific book for parents uh, forthcoming uh, later this summer called Let Them Thrive. And you'll be hearing more about that. And um, so we're really excited to have them both here today. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to them. They're who you really want to hear from. We'll have a presentation and we'll have uh, some opportunity for uh, Q&A uh, later on in the program. Katie, Kristen. Hello, everyone. I am Katie Novak. I'm super excited to be here today. Um, it's a lovely day here in New England. I see that there's people from all over. We have, you know, some Canada and Washington State, New Hampshire, but right now it's a nice sunny, like 80 degrees, although we're supposed to have thunderstorms soon. Um, Kristen and I are longtime colleagues. We call ourselves work BFFs, and we're so happy to be here today to talk about our experience working together with Kristen as the superintendent of schools and I as her fearless uh, number two as the assistant superintendent of schools. And we were really inspired to create something, a playbook, I guess, if you will, for how to universally design a district from walking in on the first day when, you know, 377 of our closest colleagues hadn't even heard of UDL. And we really set out to create a system that would be inclusive and engaging for everyone. So we're just going to tell you a little bit about our journey and hopefully it can help to pave your journey as well. Kristen? Hi, so I'm Kristen Rodriguez, and it's been a distinct pleasure to work with Katie in, in two different districts and, and uh, have the opportunity to look at the implementation of universal design for learning in different environments. And so we really couldn't find a playbook or um, uh, anything in writing that showed how to implement universal design for learning. So we decided, why not? We'll, we'll help craft something. So we did some research and, and, and wrote universally designed leadership. And, and for us, it was a labor of love, uh, not only sharing um, those things that we thought were our, our strengths and things we were proud of, but also our challenges and how we overcame those. So it was really enjoyable. So today is really fun because we get to talk a little bit about what that looks like in, in, in application, um, thinking from the design framework all the way into implementation. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to share my screen now, and that's going to prevent me from seeing the chat. So Kristen, just let me know if it doesn't, if it doesn't go my way. Okay. Okay, so first of all, we want this to be interactive. We wanna have multiple options for action and expression. So you're not just sitting here watching us. Um, you know, we don't wanna be like a TV show. We want this to be really interactive where you feel like you can have an opportunity to ask us questions, to comment on our own questions um, throughout. So feel free at any time. We have the amazing Mindy Johnson on the back channel who will make sure we know when questions are coming. So when you see an orange star, what you're going to know is that it's your turn to participate. If you'd like to go on Twitter, you can go to hashtag UDL chat. If you'd like to go into the chat box, that's great. Um, and if anything comes up afterwards, feel free to email Kristen or I. 
So we want to start off by talking a little bit about Simon Sinek's Golden Circle. And we gave this a little UDL love and a little UDL flavor, but essentially Simon Sinek, he wrote Start With The Why, and he's this great, amazing leader of leaders. And he talks about that what sets apart organizations that are really, really outstanding from those that are just mediocre. And he says that it's really about starting with the why. And so a lot of organizations start with the what. You know, what is it that we do? Well, we teach kids or we provide professional development or we make sure that we, you know, support teachers. And then we might even talk about how we do it. And hopefully if you're on this webinar, it's because you're really interested in doing that using the Universal Design for Learning framework. But the last thing a lot of us get to is why. Why are any of us doing this work? Why are any of us in schools or in professional development facilities or in higher ed or whether we're homeschooling our kids? Why are we doing it? And when we start with that why, it really centers the purpose of what we do and how we do it. And so we want to start with the why in this webinar and that we really want to talk about why UDL is absolutely necessary to transform your organization. So why do we have organizations that so we can really create successful opportunities for everybody involved in them? Then we're going to talk about what UDL is and specifically at the systems level, what it looks like in professional development and faculty meetings. Because before we wrote Universally Designed Leadership, the lens of UDL has really been on what's happening in the classroom. And we want to kind of change that and talk about that it, it doesn't just happen in the classroom. And we even argue that maybe it really can't happen in the classroom systematically unless it's happening at the district-wide level. And then lastly, thinking about how you can incorporate UDL into your own leadership practice. So we're going to start off um, a, a little bit talking about the four components that are really critical for leadership. Now, this is from the book Primal Leadership, which is an internationally best-selling book on leadership. And I want you to just think about these four different aspects of leadership. And a really amazing, amazing leader is very, very self-aware. They're able to self-manage. They're very socially aware. And they're able to manage relationships. And as I was thinking about this, it really like hit home to me that a really Really strong leader is an engaged leader because on the right hand side of your screen you'll see the UDL guidelines um, that it's basically the principle for um, providing multiple means of engagement which is for the effective network and the purpose of that is you want to create a purposeful motivated learner but when you're thinking about the different aspects of leadership they almost align specifically so if you're thinking about a leader who is really self-aware it's somebody who is able to self-assess and reflect and know their own strengths and limitations. And so if you look under the guideline number nine, provide options for self-regulation, it's really about that, is in order to be motivated, in order to really transform your organization, you have to be able to reflect and know what your strengths are, but you also have to realize that all of us have significant variability and we all have limitations as well. Um, the next is once we understand what our limitations are and our strengths are, we really have to focus on that self-management piece. How do we cope and how do we regulate with the fact that leadership is a tough position and we have to make decisions sometimes that are not going to be popular and there's a lot of stakeholders involved and how do we manage that? How do we able to, to always make sure that we have class and poise and that we're flexible and adaptable and that we're really listening to the feedback of other people? And so that falls under, first of all, self-regulation, but also it's this effort and persistence is we self-manage by collaborating and we self-manage by having mastery-oriented feedback from others. And then you need to be socially aware. Do you really understand what's happening in your organization? And you have to think about this as the, the undiscussables is, do you know what the water cooler conversations are? Do you really understand the politics? And there's no way to do that without fostering collaboration and community. You have to understand where everybody is coming from in your organization. And so often, as leaders, we'll make decisions with other administrators. But there are so many other people who need to be at that table. And we need to listen to their voices. And we need to reflect on, on their contributions and their feedback. And that allows us to really understand what's happening in our organization and making sure that everybody is heard. And then lastly, how do we manage those relationships? And this comes down to, you know, all of these guidelines for engagement is we need to make sure that every relationship we have is really authentic and that it's meaningful and that we create a culture in which we're really minimizing that threat of anyone coming to us and providing us with that feedback and collaborating with us because they know that we're going to reflect and self-assess and cope with that in a really meaningful way. And so, you know, I love this idea of an engaged leader. And so, again, if I want to connect it back to primal leadership, 
we think back to, well, how does that break down? And they talk about it as the neuroanatomy of leadership. And so what does it mean to be self-aware? It's that you have a, a really strong social, uh, emotional self-awareness, but it also means that you can really self-assess and you know your strengths and weaknesses and also that you're very confident you can stay motivated you know you believe in your power to make change and you can look at all of those bullets there and i want you to ask yourself a question because we're going to talk about variability in a minute okay one of these you're going to be really strong at and i want you to think about the bullets and not the headings so when you're looking at each of the bullet which one is your greatest strength and then also, I want you to think about what is your weakest. Now, to minimize threats and distractions, we're not going to ask you to post your weakest, but we would love for you to contribute into the chat about which aspect of this leadership are you most strong at. And I'm going to pull back from my full screen for a second just so I can read your chats. So think about that for a moment and where on that, um, on the neuroanatomy of leadership, where do you see your greatest strength? I'm so excited to see there are 164 of you right now having this amazing conversation with us. So again, in your chats, and, and so what I love, love, love about this, like I'm, I'm inappropriately excited about it, is how everyone is posting something different. <laughs> and this like speaks to exactly what Kristen and I are talking about, how leadership is a village, that it's not just one of us. One of us can't make this happen. And so we see, um, you know, Peter, he's very, very adaptable. And if he works with Aaron, Aaron really understands what's happening with the organization. And there's people who are great at relationships and building bonds. And, and it's this right here is like a commercial for variability is we're sitting right now with almost 200 leaders and all of us have very, very different strengths. And if we were to ask you, we would have very, very different weaknesses. And so it's kind of like a puzzle where we need to come together to find somebody or something to fill us in where we are maybe not the strongest. And so I love looking at this because I can just imagine us all in a room together. And um, I love what um, Finn just said, a leadership team will be more effective than any leader. And that is what we're talking about, fostering collaboration and community, having teachers become leaders. And so as you're looking at this, I want you to say, oh my goodness, it, we're just going off. People are now just saying what they're weak at. Like right now, like it's just amazing. Let's just all get together and like hang out all night. So moving on, um, we're gonna go to, I'm gonna share my screen again so I won't be able to see your chat, but I promise I'll get back into it and read everything. And I wanna talk about this idea of variability and how what I just asked you to do is really thinking about your jaggedness. So Todd Rose, who is a, a lover of UDL, he's at Harvard University, he just wrote The End of Average, and he coined this term called the jaggedness principle. And he's basically saying that we need to get rid of the idea to think that there's like average or good or bad. Because if you took us as leaders and you plotted us on every leadership aspect, you're gonna see that we're very high in some areas and we're very low in some areas. And most of us will average out to being somewhere in the middle of that average, but nobody's average. So when you're looking at those two gentlemen, you know, you might be able to say, oh yeah, so the guy in purple, he's average, but he's not average because he's, he's tall, um, but his shoulders are actually really, really narrow as well as his chest. And so if we were to make an average suit, it would be too short for him and it would be really baggy on the shoulders and it would be very ill-fitting. Um, and the same thing happens for the student over here um, in the bottom corner, whereas we say, you know, she's an average student or at worst, we actually pick one of those plot points and we say that she's a struggling student. Maybe she's, you know, she, we, we feel like she's... Um, you know, not capable of learning because she is, is below this, this mythical average in reading and vocabulary, but she's highly inquisitive and very, very knowledgeable. And so if you were to take her and, and have her really think about where are you strong, where are you weak, the question is how do you maximize those strengths and how do you address those weaknesses by being really self-directed and creating plans for the improvement of yourself and for your organization. So I'm now going to transition to Kristen. So just giving a little bit of background on what it means to be a strong, engaged leader. And then she's going to talk about why this is so important. So I, I love to wear a cape. Um, I've been known literally to wear a pink, sparkly uh, superwoman cape to uh, any of our leadership trainings. Uh, but it's really um, important that we take our capes off. 
Um, and as we think about leadership, uh, we really aren't just taking that cape off and being the sole uh, person leading the work because um, it's physically and emotionally exhausting. We need to take our cape off and share the work because it's, it's what works. And it's a very similar analogy to what we use with our teachers when we when we talk to them about universal design for learning in their classrooms. And we say it's not your classroom, it's the student's classroom. And the students need to direct their own learning. Similarly, as an administrator, district strategy towards addressing these issues of equity are not yours alone to solve. It's not your sole burden. And you must be a facilitator of the change and not just the sole leader. So thinking of a little bit about um, a colleague, Alan November wrote, Who Owns the Learning? And I'm sure a lot of you uh, have read that book. And in that book, he talks about transforming classrooms into digital learning forms farms and in these digital learning farms the the students have ownership and global connections are essential and in that same framework as leaders if we can design our work as a way to enhance capacity and ownership you know then we don't have to wear that cape all alone wearing the cape is exhausting and again it's physically unsustainable so we have to take it off because shared ownership is simply more effective and if we put the cape on those around us, I have found that they fly far higher than I ever was capable of doing alone. So uh, that's our first thing. Take, take that cape off. Um, I'm going to begin this next slide with a fantastic quote by George Carlin. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it says, have you ever noticed that anybody driving slower than you is an idiot and anyone driving faster than you is a maniac? So this, this quote, beyond being absolutely hilarious in my mind, is, is, a, is a function of human nature. Uh, we are where we're at, and often we're really overwhelmed if people are going faster or slower than we're comfortable being. This joke assumes that we're all driving in separate vehicles. So in my mind, the trick is let's get us all on the same train. Let's pretend for a minute that designing district strategy is like playing a game. So many of us do this alone. We're in essence playing a game of solitaire. The superintendent or the principal, they own this plan and they give it unto the district or to unto the school. And if we think about engagement, absolutely the only person truly engaged in this game is that one sole leader. And what's the end result? It's either a win or loss. That 50-50 proposition is not the best odds for our kiddos. So let's play another analogy game. Let's consider we're playing Monopoly for a moment. This is when a leader shares that work with a really small group of people. After all, there's only so many uh, game pieces that can be uh, passed around. So who is that group? Maybe that is a, a small group of uh, leaders, administrators within the district or the school board. Have you ever watched a game of Monopoly being played? Right, enough said. For those not watching or participating, it's completely unengaging. So for this next analogy, I actually had to ask my kiddo because my extent of gameplay ends at uh, physical board games. So I said, is there any kind of like online or interactive uh, games that are out there where multiple people are playing at once? So, you know, after tilting his head and thinking about it for a minute, he said, uh, Google World of Warcraft, mom. So I did. Uh, and World of Warcraft is this multiplayer online role playing game. And there are literally thousands of people who are playing simultaneously. This game is continuous. The characters grow, they change, and they adapt. Each has their own role, and technology is a tool in building that community. So I don't know about you, but personally, uh, I'd rather play a lot less solitaire. So if we want to be together on this train moving towards inclusive schools, each of us has an essential role in the success of that mission. So I'm thinking about this concept, Elon Musk's Hyperloop. And this is his, uh, it came around 2013, I believe, his response to transportation, train transportation. So if we're getting all on the train, let's think about that. Recently, a California-based company called Hyperloop One proposed a system to be set up on Highway 27, which if you don't know is in Florida. And they are saying that with this new Hyperloop train, they could literally get from Miami to Orlando in 25 minutes. How do they do this? They do it by removing all the friction from the technology. And they use solar technology for self-powering. So it offers far superior form of transportation. In my mind, I really think we all need to design our own versions of this Hyperloop. We need to remove the barriers, which is the friction. 
and we need to engender the capacity of our stakeholders so it becomes self-powering. So how do we do that? Um, we're going to give a moment for, for you to reflect on it, but just to share an example of how we did that in Groton Dunstable, we utilized the UDL framework um, in our leadership practices. We began to see a strong foundation built for the Hyperloop framework. And how it began? Well, it began with shared decision making. So if we just take this desire to increase inclusive practices in our district and we utilize the framework, it's going to be effective. In our case, um, you know, we really uh, participated in what we call a future search model, and that was over 80 stakeholders who spent a Friday evening and a full Saturday with us. And in that, we began to unpack what our needs were as a district, and we created a vision for the future. So we use the principles of UDL and the design of that work. So think about the language of the expanded guidelines. We literally constructed a community of stakeholders who engaged in a common interest, which in our case was improving our schools. And we created these cooperative groups and they had goals and roles and responsibilities. And we encouraged and supported their opportunities to interact with this. And again, we didn't just stop there, but that was the beginning of our work together. And so I'd love to hear from you. What are some ways that you can engage your stakeholder in the implementation of UDL? Who are those essential stakeholders to your work and how do you engage them? So I'm just gonna open up the chat, the chat box and have you uh, take a moment to just reflect and share. How might you engage stakeholders in the implementation of UDL? I love this concept of, again, the Simon Sinek, starting with that why, that important concept in the bullseye. Engage rather than involve them. So owner talked a little bit about, you know, starting from the ground up. It's really too late if you're introducing UDL after you've designed a strategy around it. They need to be there from the beginning. Breaking down barriers is huge and important. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm getting a little feedback a little on feedback. that. Sorry, guys. So this concept so of self is really important. important. And it's something that we talked about in our book in terms of conducting a needs assessment. So that's a great, a great technique somebody shared. Modeling it is huge. And really, that was the main context of why we drafted universally designed leadership was if we're not modeling universally designed practices, how can we absolutely expect our staff to do that? So, oh, so many wonderful things from PLCs to Twitter chats, faculty participation. <laughs> Someone loves Twitter chats. I love Twitter chats as well. Thank you so much. So again, we'll catalog all of these, um, but I'm just going to um, move on to the next slide. And I want to talk a little bit about how, how we did that, not only from the context of thinking about our needs and our vision, but really when we began to design the strategy. So we brought the same group back when we designed our strategy. And when it came time to develop our community-friendly materials, we brought them back again. Uh, well, what you're seeing on the screen are actually members of our stakeholder group. Uh, there's administrators there, school board members, town selectmen, teachers. We also had students and parents and community and local business leaders uh, present. This group uh, that evening was tasked with reading our draft documents, and we asked them to simply highlight any words or vocabulary that they didn't understand. For each highlighted term, they wrote them on an index card, simple technique. And as you can imagine, can you guess what one of the words was that they didn't understand? And as you can imagine, it was universal design for learning, UDL. We made a, a strategic um, decision not to strip out some of the key vocabulary terms, um, such as universal design for learning. We really wanted to hold true to that uh, terminology. So we had to find a way for that language to be accessible to our community. So we said, okay, these are the words that they don't understand. Here's the jargon that's, that's becoming a barrier for our community. And these groups of educators, you can actually see Katie Novak. She doesn't even, did you even see yourself in that photo? How fun is that? So she's in that group and we, 
you're muted still, yeah. but you're, I'm serious. there you go. You're saying fa funny things. So, so what we said was, you guys are the experts. We want you to use plain language and explain what this terminology means to our community members. And they did that really effectively. And the community members were like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it when you explain it that way. So then we said, okay, we want you to explain that exactly like you did and put it on the back of those index cards to define what that vocabulary term means in essence in a way that is accessible to everyone. So they wrote those definitions down, and then we use those throughout our process in multiple ways. We called it elevator speech. So if you're going to just talk about what universal design for learning is, and you're sitting with somebody at a baseball game or a soccer game or in the supermarket, how could you describe that? Uh, we also talked about and we utilized them as a hover over feature, as a glossary and our online. So if, if someone was looking up universal design for learning, they hovered over it, they could see a definition that was community accessible. And we used uh, descriptors of it in handouts. So we used it in many different ways. The point was not to water down the concept, but to make it accessible to our community. Ready for you. So when we, you know, the whole, the whole idea was getting our entire community on board with what we were about to do to transform teaching and learning, because there's really far reaching consequences of it, especially in a, the MTSS model, which is much more focused on both teachers and students, um, as opposed to just students. And so originally RTI was about what do you do when students don't learn? And MTSS really asked us to take a step back and look at a comprehensive system for having really strong leadership and integrated and sustainable sustainable plan to make sure that, you know, that the, 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 the whole system could move forward in a way that was universally designed. And there was a real focus on teacher professional development. And so a lot of times when we think about um, teachers professional development, it is often very similar to the traditional style of education in that a district decides that UDL is going to be important and then all teachers have to take universal design for learning professional development, which is almost a little bit like the anti-UDL because if you're saying this is important and now you're all going to learn it this way from these people during this time, it doesn't allow people to really experience what that is. And so we were committed to having a lot of choices. Um, we still had a goal. We wanted everyone to about, know about UDL, but we realized that there was a lot of different ways to arrive at that place. Um, but as we talked about at the beginning, one leader or two leaders does not make a leadership team. And so we decided to put together a professional development committee, um, which was eight amazing practicing educators um, on unit A, so nurses, psychologists, teachers, and then Kristen and myself. And basically we sat down and we said, okay, so what are our needs? Like, let's, let's do a variability study on our district. What is really strong about our professional development? And what is really weak and where is that jaggedness and how do we address it now i have to tell you admittingly that we we didn't have a lot of strengths um there's something in massachusetts called the mass tell survey this is public information anyone can look it up and every couple of years they ask all the teachers in the commonwealth to answer a bunch of different survey questions and when there was a question about there are adequate resources for professional development in your district a whopping 9.7 percent of our teachers agreed with that statement so we were looking at about 90 percent of our, our teaching staff did not feel like uh, professional development really met their needs or was adequate. So we had an amazing opportunity and we got together with this PD committee. Um, we did pay for release time um, in order to, to be with them a few times a year and we talked about what are our needs and then what are our goals and how many options can we create to get there. And again, it was very important to us that it was not just, you know, Kristen and I in our office trying to figure this out, but that we had meetings where we sent surveys to every single school. Um, we didn't just meet with the teachers. We went around to every school and met with the paraeducators and we basically asked them, what is it that you want and what is it that you need in order to be able to universally design um, teaching and learning for students? And so again, there was all different people who were involved in this process. And what we ultimately decided to do was to, to really get nitty gritty with the data that we were looking at during that needs assessment process. Because it's one thing to know, okay, 9% of your teachers are happy with professional development, which leaves like 200 teachers who are not. But why and what data do we have to that really shows us that? Um, on the right is the Harvard University data wise process. They have a really amazing um, you know, uh, seminar during the summer where you can learn about it. But it basically the very beginning of the data wise process is to get together for collaborative work. So our PD committee 
was all about getting together and really starting that from the ground up. We wanted to prepare to look at data together. And we wanted to make sure that we really understood all the different measures and, and what it could tell us. So we were gonna look at student achievement data because clearly the places where our students were struggling um, were places that our teachers needed a little bit of extra professional development. Um, we also, you know, it's important moving on that you ask, um, that you ask students for their feedback on their, on their um, experience. Um, again, in Massachusetts, um, we have a, a student feedback survey uh, component of our educator evaluation system. So teachers and administrators are encouraged to survey their learners to find out what their own variability is like and that to use personally to create their own goals for their improvement. Um, we had the staff data on professional development, but we also had student behavioral data. When you're looking at, um, you know, the times that students are leaving class and absentee rates and things like that, it helps you to try to get a better sense is, you know, what do we need to focus on? And then there's a lot of qualitative data. And so Kristen and I, we took a little road show around the district and we did focus groups and we asked them, what is it that you need? Because our teachers are learners. Um, one thing that I say all the time is, if as administrators, if a teacher ever came to an administrator and said, those kids will just never learn, I'm, I'm not even gonna bother, we would be horrified. And in my experiences, kind of traveling around and presenting on UDL, I do hear administrators say that, well, those teachers won't do it. And that's not true. They're just not doing it yet because we haven't provided them with enough data about why it's important and valuable and authentic and meaningful. And we haven't minimized the threat and distraction of trying something really new and taking a risk. And maybe we haven't created a culture where people feel like it's okay to fail if they try this. And so you have to have those conversations. You have to get into classrooms and see teaching and learning. Kristen, when she was a superintendent, would, would you know, one, one day a week would be in a school and walk through classrooms. So what's happening in classrooms? And then also, what is the research say about professional development and all of that kind of allows us to go through this data-wide process and then create an action plan and what our action plan ended up being was a professional development catalog and what we wanted to make sure was that everybody had options that would meet their needs based on the data that we found and so um, you can see right there I just blew up the table of contents but there's different sections of this and so what our multi-part series was is instead of um, using three half days a year to do something different every time they actually get to pick a course um, we offered about 20 different courses and if you were an elementary teacher you get to choose from focusing on you know social emotional learning um, through a UDL lens or how do you universally design a writing workshop um, at the middle school and high school they had you know other other offerings we also did in-service offerings which are like mini graduate courses that meet after school um, this summer alone we're offering six graduate courses so actual college in endorsed full graduate courses for teachers who want to get um, some more in-depth professional development. And we had book clubs, um, we had, you know, Twitter chats, there were so many different things that we were doing. And I'm just using the simple analogy of like a phone case. You know, why do we need choices? It's because we need choices with everything, for goodness sake. Nobody has the same phone case. And you know, after a couple months, you'll get sick of it and want a new phone case. Why? Because we are so wildly variable and we need to personalize to find our way. Because it, what is beautiful on my phone, I have this, this catchy one, if you can see me on video, it's pink. I have a pink one. Pink might not be your thing. And a graduate course might not be someone's thing because of the barriers of they can't pay for the credits or maybe they don't have the time, they don't have the childcare. Um, maybe uh, an in-service course on Reader's Workshop isn't your thing because that's one of your real strengths and you're struggling in math and you wanna know how to universally design math. And so when you're thinking about um, the difference between choices, I want you to think about options and choices because a lot of districts have options for professional development. On one day, you're learning about this, and on another day, you're learning about that, or the math teachers are doing this, and the ELA teachers are doing that, but they don't really have choices. And how can you create a district where a teacher literally has a choice of which professional development um, offering that, that's going to be the most meaningful, relevant and authentic to them to improve their practice, to transform teaching and learning for students, while also working toward this meta goal of creating a universally designed district. So I would love to know a little bit more about what choices your teachers have for professional development. And again, I'm gonna peek here on, the, on your chat. Lots of things are coming in. Okay, and so what, what people, um, what I'm seeing is we don't have a lot of choice for PD. 
Okay. It would be nice if we had choice. Occasionally we have some small choices. And so again, just as when Kristen and I first saw that data and you can look at 9% approval rating and be sad, or you can look at 9% approve it rating and be psyched because there's so much room for growth and opportunity. And that's where you're at. Whereas if you're not doing it, then, then do it, then create a plan and, and make it rain. Um, so we're saying, you know, there, we don't have any choices. Now, as we're saying systematically, is it's very difficult to sell UDL to teachers who never are able to experience the power of choice and parents who never experience the power of choice and administrators who don't experience the power of choice. And again, sometimes I think we get a little muddy in the options versus choice because there's always options, but there's, there's not a lot of choice. And so thinking about that, um, maybe you could go back to kind of your district or start off in the fall with that professional development needs assessment with the intent to try to create more choices. Now, our professional development was so successful that we ended up getting up last year when we asked about the effectiveness of our multi-part series, 99.7% of our teachers said that they were satisfied or highly satisfied, which is a growth rate of 90% in only three years. And also our student data has grown significantly. And so what we're realizing is how important professional development is. And as a result, our school committee, you know, they, they saw the data, they heard from the teachers, they saw that teachers are learners and how powerful this is. And this year we actually, just adopted a new school calendar which I'm ridiculously excited about because we're moving from 18 and a half professional development hours a year in our school calendar to 58 and a half and so we are now able to provide our teachers with an additional 40 hours of professional development in a universally designed framework because people saw the power of when we did it how both teaching and learning improved exponentially so um, we're gonna play a little bit and I want you to be brutally honest with yourself when you um, participate in this activity. So the last three faculty meetings that you either ran as an administrator or you participated in as a staff member, I want you to rate which one were you most closely aligned with. Answer A, B, or C. And if you have a few seconds to read the hilarious cartoon uh, to your left. So is it A, where assigned seats were created mostly because everyone hates each other, as in the cartoon. Think bad wedding table planning in that one. Was it B, staff sat in factions? Now, I wanna say I'm a former high school English teacher, so that's why I'm picking on the English department, not that we have that experience in our district. But let's pretend that, in, I'm, I'm not saying this happens in your districts, but it might, where the whole, English department sits together in a cluster. Now they get along great, but nobody else dares sit with them. Not a science teacher, not a math teacher, because everyone knows their place. Or is it answer C, where staff choose where they sat based on the flexible options that they helped design and topics that were relevant to their practice. So I'm looking up here and um, I'd love to know uh, what D was, but it's a forced choice for people. And yeah, a lot of people are at B. A lot of the respondents are looking at what, uh, that, you know, they get along, but really uh, this concept of staff ownership in the process, we haven't really quite, quite gotten there. And that was really a, a learning activity for, for Katie and I in our leadership practice. Even with our administrators, we realized that we were really leading a tremendous amount of the uh, professional development in the meetings that we had, even with our leadership team. And we were then not modeling what we wanted them to do with their staff. So we're gonna go to the next slide. And in the next slide, um, we wanna think about how do we fix that faulty faculty function? And so we're going to pretend like we are, uh, we're going to be introducing universal design for learning. We're going to be talking about universal design for learning. So you have a couple of options here. Is it going to be answer A? And again, your current practice, it, do staff sit back and passively listen to your PowerPoint presentation on UDL? And then they ask silly questions because they don't know what you're talking about. And then you leave the meeting and it's never brought up again. Is it B? where uh, you put a lot of energy and time into this. The staff walk in, they uh, didn't know until they got in there that they're gonna be talking about universal design for learning. Uh, the principal prepared three stations based on the three principles of UDL. 
Now the staff get to choose a station that they want to sit at, although it's really hard because they have no idea or prior knowledge about what UDL is or the principles, but they get to choose. Well, wait, wait, they get to choose except for if one of the stations is empty because people don't have an interest in that, uh, they're forced to go there. They're quote unquote encouraged to go there because after all, you put in tons of prep work into that station, so somebody has to sit there. So once they're seated in that station, the staff participate in already defined tasks. They have to read an article on that particular principle of UDL and they have to discuss it. Or is it answer C, where the staff helped you define the agenda, either through something like an exit ticket feedback from a previous meeting or online surveys, and they participated in the planning and the facilitation of a meeting. And that meeting includes flexibility, choice, and removal of barriers. And as we just talked about and Katie discussed, choice, you know, there might be, we, we talk a lot about an analogy when we work with people introducing universal design for learning. And if it's, if it's two choices that you don't like or that you're not comfortable with, that you can't access that's all well and good uh, but it's not really authentic choice that the framework is expecting of us and that's what b is you put a lot of time in there you have your cape on you have your cape on and you're running with it and it's your meeting it's no longer the faculty's meeting it's your meeting that you're running so i'm just going to pull up the chat section and a lot of people are b right a b some getting close to c and what we always talk about is don't think about your best meeting think about every meeting that you hold and where are you in that framework for the most part so if you're still landing fairly closely to b for the most part i want you to think about what guidelines or checkpoints from the universal design for learning framework would be helpful when designing agendas to get you to c so we're just going to have you have a time to reflect and, and maybe give some suggestions and answers out there about how that would work. Eric just asked a really interesting question too about the more choice and inclusion of faculty, the more time it takes. So if you're not going to be presenting the whole time and you're talking about staff saying, hey, can you all present? Are you then going to get pushback? Like, well, I'm not, I don't have time to, to create that. One thing that's really great too is to give a lot of different options for how people are going to participate in it. Because for example, um, if you are to ask everyone to make a presentation, that is very timely. But if you could also, you know, send out an email or something and does anyone have a really great lesson that they taught this week and they're willing to show student work? That is staff being involved in the creation of a staff meeting. Or would you know you had um, you've been practicing UDL for three years? Would you be willing to just have a small group just for question and answer? And so there's a lot of, of you know very high prep and very low prep ways to still involve staff. And if you have that menu of how are staff going to be involved, and you're truly open to any of their suggestions, you're going to end up in a much better place. Um, if you're sending out, uh, okay, everyone. You need to put in a proposal to present for 20 minutes. You have to have five slides. You have to do an activity. Again, we're falling into anti-UDL territory. And so it's this whole idea of, okay, so it's clear that everyone's really confused about what this looks like in practice. And so I wanted to know if any of you would like to come up and either share a student work or share a lesson or record your class for five minutes. And when you provide those options, again, you're allowing people to experience the power of a framework, you know, because you are modeling it as opposed to putting on your cape and then saying, now everyone's going to help me, um, which again, you're not going to model it as exactly um, as, the, as, the, as it's intend, intended to be. You know, and, and again, if they're in the, in, if they're participating in the development, in the design of this, they'll be really honest and open with you about what feels too much, where that, where that tension lays comfortably for them, what aspects of that they, they say it would be great if you could facilitate that or which ones they want to take a lead on, which uh, activities. Now, one of the things that Katie and I did, understanding, knowing that this takes a lot of time, right, universally designing anything takes hours to do, although it looks it's really uh, breezy and easy. It takes a tremendous amount of prep and planning time. And so when we work with our staff, in our case, working with leaders, modeling it for their staff, we embedded that planning and feedback time in our existing meetings because we knew how overwhelmed they were with all those other tasks. So part of your facilitation process is creating structures uh, so that you can um, have them participate in ways that they won't push back at. And I'm just looking at some of the Q&A 
uh, that's coming out. And so people ask about how big is the district that these examples are coming from? Katie and I uh, have this example coming from a district of about 2,400 um, students. So it's a small Massachusetts district, although both of us have worked with much larger districts in the implementation of this. And, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about when we, when we speak about, you know, how, how do you scale this up to a larger district is creating those kinds of communities uh, amongst and within some of those larger districts so they can contribute in a meaningful way. And uh, one of these other questions that came up was, how do we convince people that choice is manageable and sustainable, especially when they're wearing a lot of hats? In my mind, or in my, oh, I love someone said that's not that small. Thank you for your 800 students. Um, that 2,400 doesn't feel so small. We work with, with, with districts that have thousands, and they kind of look and say, huh, that's nice, but how do you scale it up? And, and, and we say, trust us, when you create those functions and structures, you can do that really effectively. So when people are overwhelmed with all the hats and tasks, when they participate in the needs assessment and they understand that there's importance in inclusive practice and they help design um, what that vision of the future looks like, they will dedicate time and energy into the response to that. And uh, it's a matter of prioritizing it. You know, one of of the things we did was we we know that districts often have initiative overload and so we created an initiative review process with our particular faculty and we said okay what are all those initiatives that are going on and we looked and we created a, a physical diagram and one of our our teachers created a beautiful analogy of a tree growing out with the roots up through the branches and leaves and the root being that professional learning network and the leaves being you know the student's success and said everything needs to be running up that tree to the leaves and we all have to be moving in the right direction. All those roots have to be interconnected. And that's why we say universal design for learning is not just one new initiative. It's, it's emphasizing strategies and initiatives that enhance meeting the needs based on your self-assessment and using universally designed practices to get you there. That way you're not adding an extra layer of frustration or feeling overwhelmed. Um, someone did ask if we did have a sample needs assessment available to share. And so uh, we actually have our needs assessment from our district up on the district website. And we're, we're happy to uh, find a way to share that link for you. So um, I'm just going to move on with um, the last slide that I want to talk to, and that is, what does this look like? And this is an example from an elementary school, the Heathbrook Elementary School in Tewksbury, Massachusetts. And um, the principal had taken uh, a course that we offered on universally designed leadership. And one of the activities and outcomes was to build an agenda that was universally designed. And I just wanted to share this as an example. Um, so taking one of the simple checkpoints, how do you integrate those checkpoints? into the development of your practice, building fluencies for graduated levels of support. You can see by active thought and participation, he was able to uh, develop, and she was able to, as a group that created this, was able to develop activities that had scaffolds and supports. So they participated in this as a whole group. Now they shared a graphic organizer. No one, not people didn't have to use a graphic organizer in their work, but they did. Uh, have an opportunity to have it accessible should they want it. So they looked at what does universally designed practice look like, for example, through videos. They talked about key discussions and concepts and vocabulary, then they shared uh, videos, reflected on those, and then they went into small groups, breakout sessions to identify those best practices. And then if you look at the exit ticket, it is, okay, so we've done it as a whole group, we've done it as a small group, how are you going to apply this to your practice in your classroom? And, it, and the, the principal is asking them, what are one to three strategies that you can implement in your own classroom? So if you look at the top left corner of the slide, you're going to see actual rubric language. Uh, this, is, this comes right from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And this is the best version of practice that they have in relationship to meetings for school-based administrators. And you can see here that they absolutely tell us to take that, cap, that cape off. They say that in order to be exemplary, you really need to plan and facilitate staff-led engaging meetings where small groups of educators are creating solutions to instructional issues. And in that respect, if you universally design your practice, you're not leading those, you're not leading those meetings anymore. You're not running those meetings. They are not your meetings. They are their meetings. And in that vein, you'll get a lot less pushback. 
because they'll own it and they'll want it and they'll participate more willingly. So now we, um, we have some time for you to ask us some questions. And so again, I'm just going to get rid of this slide for a second. Um, one of you asked um, right here, it says, can you address how cultural responsiveness is embedded in the guidelines? So if you are not going to the CAST annual symposium this summer, starting on July 31st, um, it's, it's very interesting that social justice is actually the full theme of, of um, the of the symposium and, and what you want to think about when where does cultural responsiveness and social justice fit in is first of all if you just step back from the framework in general is it's for all students and it's about the idea that all students will have the um the the opportunity to design and deliver their own education and so how do they do that is if you look at guideline number seven on the guidelines 2.0 you're looking at how do you provide choices that are relevant authentic and meaningful and how do you do that in a way that you're minimizing threats and distractions and that means that students have to be encouraged to bring themselves into the learning environment and staff have to be encouraged to bring themselves and so you know if we think of this as a buffet where we can add a certain amount of options the the last option is always Ways, suggest something else <laughs> so this whole idea of let's say that we were in a classroom and we'd say something like okay we're gonna be focusing on responding to text I have these five books here that I would recommend um, you know I want you to choose something fiction that you're interested in and challenges you you know if you don't want to read one of these like go to the library find something like bring something from your culture bring something from home ask your parents a book they would recommend ask your neighbors um, that's a way to bring culture into the classroom and in the same way that you can do this with your staff of saying you know I was thinking about doing this in this meeting um, one of the things that I like to leave professional development with is uh, whenever I teach a class whenever I work with the district there's only one thing I want to know when I leave what is one thing I could have done better to engage you and over time if you do that at every meeting people might say things like you know what you serve snacks today and it's Ramadan and we're fasting and then that allows you to say okay I understand that this person has a voice and I embrace that voice and now I realize my own implicit bias and I realize my own variability and that allows you to be better every single time and so it's really about connecting that there's no way that we can know the experience of all people and so we have to empower them to bring their own voices and to bring their own choices to ensure that we're all you know really together in a community of learners and not just a community led by a learner and I just want to um, I, I really want to acknowledge Mindy Johnson she has been a wonderful on the back end giving you resources and so if you haven't seen them in the chat box she did already link up to our needs assessment feel free to look at that she also linked up to the uh, third annual UDL symposium where it's really focused on social justice and also a really great blog entry by Joni uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say her name. You're very good friends with her, Katie. What's her? How do we pronounce Joni's last Jody name? Anger. That's what I wanted to say. And 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 Joni has a great blog that I've read on UDL and cultural responsive practices. So there's some additional resources that you can participate if that's an area of focus. I am loving, loving, loving uh, your uh, some of your responses about your ah home moments. You know, shifting from. Um, my meeting to their meeting also somebody talking about you know from sage to facilitator and how hard that is sometimes to do and again you know the, the the reason that we always say it's okay to take the cape off is because sometimes we feel as leaders that we're supposed to have that cape on you know they're all really busy doing their own work I have to do all of this work for them um, it'll make their life easier but we know that um, that's that doesn't work uh, and it becomes it becomes um, all about you and, and your focus even though you're not intending for that to be and so um, you know one of the things that Katie talked about is that that abysmal professional development uh, those survey results now we walked in and we said okay let's look at those mass tell survey results and they were 9%. We didn't have a clue why, because we weren't there to ask that question. If we had just said, okay, well, we have this other version in our in a previous district, and, and you know, we, we both know that that worked, and we're going to bring it in, and we're just going to do it, um, I don't think we would have been successful because they're different cultures and they're different districts. What we really did was say why we unpacked that. Why are the results where they're at? Um, and created strategy um, around that and obviously uh, universal design for learning framework was perfect because it met all of the areas that they that they wanted in terms of having participation having choice having flexibility removing some of those barriers for them so um, I'm just I think we I think we nailed it yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
We need more questions. We still have four more minutes left. And so that's time for probably one or two more questions before we have to give it back to the big boss over at CAST. Um, but again, this has been, I mean, it's really amazing to connect to other leaders who are currently doing this work. And regardless of the position that you're at, know that there is an amazing opportunity to make great, great change. And even though it might take a long time, as you know, we worked for three years to get to a place where we said, okay, now we're really ready to start implementing. Um, it was three years of preparing and exploring and starting to implement, and it was so worth it. And so the, the big part of UDL with students is this belief that change is possible. Um, and to believe that if you, you know, if there's always a way to reach your goal, and if your goal is to create a district where all students have an opportunity to be in a classroom where they're challenged at a level, they're valued for who they are, and that they're, they're really motivated to try to, to capture more and to be more, um, know that it is within your reach. But just like learning it's not easy that the greatest things in life to achieve are the things that are really hard to achieve actually and you know if you think back to your greatest accomplishments that you've ever had professionally or personally it involved struggle and involved mindset it was the marathon you ran it was graduating you know with your master's degree and you were the first person in your family you know it was overcoming an illness those are the greatest things we can achieve and although it's not easy to transform a district it is absolutely possible if you keep that goal and you stay motivated and you surround yourself with people that are better than you at a lot of different things. And so Kristen and I never, it was never just us. It's really about your team. It's about all stakeholders. And to know that every weakness you have, it's someone else's strengths. And the more you connect and you rely on other stakeholders, the more magic you can make in this framework. So we're, we're so grateful that you took some time to learn and we learned from you. So a lot of you shared some, some great practices that, that we're gonna go back in and sharpen our toolkit with. Um, uh, one, one person just asked a little bit about how does this framework kind of explore its way or work into its way in higher education? The leadership aspect is exactly similar and, and can be applied. Um, and in the classroom, uh, those same principles can be applied. And CAST does have a website um, called udlonecampus.cast.org that Mindy put. Um, I will be presenting actually at Cambridge College on Universal Design for Learning, um, doing a, a keynote later this month. And it's interesting because in 2008, the Higher Education Act in the United States came out that uh, talked about implementing Universal Design for Learning in those uh, contexts. But it hasn't, it, it, what I'm finding is similar to our classrooms, we really need to collectively embrace this concept and spend some real energy and time getting there. So if you're in higher ed and you're not there yet, no worries, lots of uh, colleagues and peers and some good supports around. How do we start to implement it? Um, and one person had asked about, uh, are the things that we're talking about today in the book? Absolutely, we drew that right from the book. And what one of the things that was really important uh, for Katie and I in designing this book was that it was concrete and practical. Um, things that we stumbled on or stumbled across or stumbled with and were able to see light at the end of the rainbow. The, the modeling aspect of, in our faculty meetings and in professional development, we have one on family and community engagement. Those aspects that we as leaders, if we don't think about how do we apply the framework to those practices, um, we just, we just haven't spent enough time and energy. We might be doing pockets of it, but it takes purposeful planning and collaboration to get yourself there. So uh, someone had asked, is that in there? And absolutely it is. So again, we're at our last minute here. So David Gordon, will you come back on and give us the grand finale? Yes, I certainly will. Here I am. I've been <laughs> listening intently. I'm uh, so delighted that uh, uh, Katie and Kristen could join us today. And thank you all for taking time out of your Friday to join us as well. We will send out slides in a few days. Don't forget to go to castpublishing.org and use the code LEADER to get 20% off this book. Um, you can also find the book at Amazon or, or wherever books are sold. Uh, and uh, finally, please send us your book ideas. If you want to write a book, uh, send us a proposal. We'd love to talk to you about it. The last time Katie did a webinar, I got a, uh, an email uh, after the webinar and uh, we have signed a contract and uh, are publishing that book in the fall. So uh, if you'd like to be in this chair doing a webinar next year, let us know. Uh, everybody have a fabulous weekend. Look for the slides and the recording of this. Katie and Kristen, uh, you guys are just fabulous and, and uh, 
a home run today. Thank you for your, your hard work and, and for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. So great. Bye. Bye.